Wow, there's so much to try and digest and to figure out where to take this conversation, not only what you have shared with us, but because I know both of you are a little bit other things that I might want to probe you about that didn't come up in your presentations. But Anne, let me start with some of the things you said that really stuck in my mind and sounded like they might be calling for some sort of actions. Uh, you did a lot of diagnosing of just uh, the state of our society, uh, of our culture, of our loneliness, of our divisiveness. And you made a statement that one of our problems is that we have a poverty of choice of vehicles to channel the better angels that we are currently keeping pretty much off to the side. We have to have a war in order to have those kinds of vehicles to throw ourselves into that would actually live up to what your professor said, uh, to be able to actually experience adversity and then rise to that occasion and find out what that really means uh, to be somebody who has that generosity of spirit, whereas now we have poverty of spirit. So what about that? Why do we have a poverty of choice of vehicles? There's so much suffering in our world. Why, why don't we see all around us uh, ways that we could, without a war, uh, step into that zone. What's happened to us? Well, I can only give a tiny slice of, of what I see, and I don't want to do more depressing diagnosis. diagnosis. I hope that wasn't too much. Um, I was depressing myself a little bit, actually, as I was relaying it. I did some of it this morning. You're uh, in good okay. company. Oh. Um, <laughs> I mean, not to state sort of the things like we all know, but I think there's um, there's just been a profound, and it's happened through so many different ways and imperceptively, and I think it's only increased over the pandemic, but there's just been this profound like sense of aloneness that David was referring to. Mm -hmm. And I think sort of atomization. Um, and it's, on the one hand, it's like some of it's very prosaic. We are, a lot of us are very mobile. We, I, um, some years ago I was talking to, I was writing about social capital and how do we reweave our neighborhoods. And I talked to a, um, uh, older woman who had lived in Arlington, Virginia, like since the 60s, and I was asking her. Um, she was talking about like the gar they have this coordinated neighborhood where different people will take out the garbage for one another. And I asked her like, what has changed? You know, that's that's great. And but you know, you've lived here now almost 50, 55 years on I think on this block. Like, what has changed? And she said, well, when I was an, you know young, married, raising kids here. Um, all the, you know, none of the women worked, so the men would all go to work and leave one car behind, and all the women would share a car. And it was, you know, we would all use that car for play dates, for going to the hospital when a broken arm happened, and it was just this like concrete little thing. And, and my immediate, very naive response was like, that's brilliant. When I go back to my block, I'm gonna, not, that, well, all the women are working, so that I had like not thought that through. But I was like, we'll share a car. And, um, and then I thought, and then I was more honest with myself, and I realized, wait a second, um, I don't really wanna surrender my schedule to someone else's <laughs> schedule. To, so just those things, I mean, that's like a practical thing. But I think there's there's just been a level of distrust and kind of, I mean, I think part of what animates me in the morning is um, trying to canvas, try to like name reality as it is, but canvas a, a broader moral imagination. And I do think as someone, even though I work in the world of words, I actually prefer action and I prefer doers. That's how I learn. Um, but I do think there's something as we talk about the new institutions that need to be built, new moral vehicles that are, and I do think Christians have a very, this ideally, I think we're very fractured right now, but ideally this is the moment for, um, whether you want to call it a new sort of version of Martin Luther King or, but this is a version for sort of Christians to inject some real understanding of grace and creatureliness and the dignity of the soul into, we need like a massive rehumanizing movement. And there's institutions that will follow from that, like new invention, you know, and I, I think the church has a role to play, but there may be new forms of church that come along. Um, but I, Within the distrust with one another and the distrust of institutions, I think there's um, there's just some need for a uh, a deep understanding of the equal dignity of one another, and then what that calls forth in each of us that that should then reshape the vehicles we create. Because right now, I think in our aloneness, we we kind of go to this mass stage too quickly, mm -hmm. and it's not like a productive, collaborative belonging-filled 
enterprise, whether it's for justice or whether it's for the opposite. Um, You'll well, we'll express come, it better. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll come back, but go ahead, David. You probably have other uh, thoughts about the paucity of the vehicles here. Yeah, I mean, I, I, um, somehow I had a flashback to a moment. We were sitting around with some friends, and I found myself, and this is a columnist malady, explaining genetics to Francis. It was pretty good. One of our friends <laughs> said, it's like a car crash. You can't take your eyes away. <laughs> <laughs> I just had a flashback. Um, <laughs> You know, I would say it's um, a uh, distrust, the word Anne used is the key one. So if you, um, if you asked Americans, do you trust government to do the right thing most of the time through the 20th century until about 1972, about 75% said yes. Now it's 19%. More worse is social distrust. Do we trust each other, what they call interpersonal distrust? And so if you asked Americans 40 years ago, do you trust your neighbors? Uh, 55% said yes, and now it's 30%. Uh, and the younger you go, the more distrust you is. So among boomers, it's still pretty high, but among Gen Z and millennials, it's about 18, 15%. And so, and 73% of Gen Z believe people are basically selfish and out to get you. And so if that's your basic sense of menace and threat, it's super hard to do collective action. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, there's been a loss of faith, and I would call it, well, not I would call it, many people call it the institutional mindset, that yeah. change is basically done through institutions, and that an institutional leader, you led NIH for a long time, you, have, you are the inheritor of something. The institution has certain standards. It forms the people within it to be excellent in certain ways, and hopefully you steward it and pass it off better. And that institutional mindset is what you need for multi-generational change. And um, we have a friend named Yuval Levin who wrote a book saying, we have lost that sense that institutions are formative. Yes. They're now performative. Yes. They're stages upon which you demonstrate your beautiful sense. And so, for example, the United States Senate, when I started covering it, there were guys like Robert Byrd and Orrin Hatch, like, to be a senator was to be a certain thing. Now, if you looked at the the Supreme Court confirmation hearings, mm -hmm. you have Ted Cruz using the Senate in order to perform, and then after he stops performing, he's sitting there in his chair in the committee chamber checking himself on Twitter. And so that's the perfect way that it becomes a performative institution, not a formative one. Can I just add one thing to that? He just clarified what I should have said to you, which is, I agree, like, the thickening of institutions, but it's not just that. I mean, there needs to be sort of, like, a moral enchantment of what these institutions are for. And I think there's just, like, there needs to be, I often joke, like, have a dinner party and orient it around, just tag the word for at the end of every question and see how long your guests stay. Like, what is education for? What is freedom for? What is politics for? What is, and it's, it's like a very generative way. And I think that we've lost that ultimate end, which has left sort of these, the sense of bureaucracy, the sense of sort of no moral accountability and response. Like it's an ordering mechanism for why an institution could be life-giving and compelling to be a part of. So let's then talk about the church as an example of an institution <laughs> that it would seem in their current crisis ought to be in the business of coming up with repair and solutions and those vehicles that we're missing. And this morning, in what I was talking about, I was expressing deep surprise and dismay uh, when it came to acceptance of science conclusions that in many ways the church is the furthest away uh, from what you would consider to be well-established objective truth. And as a consequence to that, lives are being lost. David, you've recently written a remarkable article about saving evangelicalism from itself, which sounds bad, and it had a lot of diagnosis in it too, but it was the word saving was in there. It was not like this is hopeless. There's some hope. So let's talk about that. What, what First of all, we have all seen uh, the statistics. You mentioned many of them, which apply to the church just as well, that we have seen so much of a slippage in commitment, in devotion, um, in recognition of the meaningfulness of a relationship with the church or even with God in our particular circumstance. So we know that's part of the problem. But I also sense that there is, and you wrote about it and showed many examples, including full-page pictures of people 
who were actually activated by this, uh, who could see that maybe this is, I don't know if the right word is revival, but certainly an opportunity uh, to recover the basics of what it means to follow Jesus. Yeah. You also said that you go to a lot of meetings like this and you have people stand up and say all the terrible things that are happening to our culture and our society and then they have a little session at the end, <clears throat> that's the one we're having right now, where um, oftentimes uh, people stand up and say, okay, let's talk about solutions and then according to you there's a mumble, mumble, mumble and well, it's been great seeing you all and then everybody goes home. <laughs> so we don't want to do the mumble thing. Talk to me about where your head is at, both of you, about what we, and I think BioLogos is in a place to play a role here. These are people who are serious uh, about being scripture-based Christians and serious about truth and are desperately concerned about our situation. Okay, don't mumble. Tell us yeah. <laughs> what we need to do here. Well, one of the guys I interviewed for that story is a guy named Tabidi An Anyuile, <laughs> who was a pastor in D.C. Uh, and he first described to me all the rupture of relationship he's experienced over the last five years. Because so many people he thought were his allies turn out to be not his allies. Uh, and political rupture, religious rupture, over sex abuse scandals, everything. And then he said, you know, the three years I had real despair. The last two years have been years of hope. And I would say a couple things have happened. One, uh, the stripping that Ann talked about. Two, the rearrangement of the Christian world. And so, for example, uh, Tabidi said, you know, I never would have met Beth Moore before. Hmm. We were in completely different circles. But now she's a good friend. And I think I've certainly encountered that, that a lot of people who were never, were totally apart, are suddenly mobilized together. And then I would say there's efforts to relaunch a lot of uh, Christian institutions in a way that are consistent with maternity, that are consistent, one would say, with the faith. <laughs> um, and I would say Biologos is, is a keystone of that. I would say there are a whole series of magazines. At Christianity Today, I think, plays a very productive role. Anne's magazine, Comment, another magazine, Plow. There's, and Anne has this organization, Breaking Ground, which is a network, you can describe it, of lots of different organizations that are all, in their own way, moving in the same direction. And then there are other efforts. There's renewed, like Tim Keller's got a renewed church planting effort. Mm -hmm. There's renewed efforts to do, you know, there was a period when there was a creation of, in, of new life and university, the youth pastoring, and those institutions are fine, but they haven't really, there's been not a lot of new ones. But so there's efforts to create new ones and redo Christian education. And I think there's been an awareness that it's not only that Fox News, as I wrote in that piece, is so bright and has taken over people's minds, it's that the flickering candle of Christian formation is so dim. And so there's this refocus on Christian formation. And so these are all people who've been activated by crisis, and it's, it's really what Anne was just talking about, stripping down in time of war. Uh, and uh, so I've met a lot of people who are suddenly energized, raising money, forming new organizations, uh, and, and I don't want to use the fighting back, but recovering or, or <laughs> you know, even I have a friend who's a pastor and he's got a very embattled church. So his first act of defiance was he would take sentences from the Beatitudes and smuggle them into his sermons without citing the source. And a lot of his congregants would say, you know, I really don't like that line. That was woke. Yeah, that was woke. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <coughs> And so that's, that's the arousal of a, of a counter-movement. Yeah. And say a bit more about common ground in this context uh, in terms of the efforts you're putting into trying to bring more of a transformational something sure. out of this crisis. So, we're in. so Breaking Ground, um, and, I, and I should have brought books, I, I didn't, but Breaking Ground has become a book. It was, I launched, uh, the short of a long is when COVID hit in March 2020. I don't think of myself as very entrepreneurial, but I just felt prompted to, I was fairly new editor of this Comet magazine, which I was loving, but I just felt this sense, I was reading about pandemics historically, and it seemed like they just 
fragment the societies they strike. And I was like, we're already pretty <laughs> fragmented. This doesn't look good. Is there a way to set up a collaborative media, a collaborative sort of platform or project, shared project between a diverse array of institutions, magazines, think tanks, seminaries, associations of colleges, networks of more on the ground kind of grassroots organizations that serve the homeless and are doing racial reconciliation work and are doing sort of affordable housing innovative stuff often in very local ways. Um, is there a way to pair doers and thinkers together through civil society institutions that have, some are Catholic, some are Protestant, of various uh, theological streams, Anabaptists? Um, could we represent kind of a new Christian humanism that is responding first to crisis, seeing like what is this revealing about our society, but could we maybe be a resource by trying to see as clearly as we can, as reality itself to your talk kind of felt like it was starting to splinter. Um, what is COVID? What is George Floyd? What is all this revealing? And does the church have anything to say? And can, you know, what does the Christian imagination say? Not that we have more answers necessarily than anyone else, but we might have a little bit of um, moral fluency in at least helping ask some questions that could be resonant. So it was a publishing project, but really what's happened is it's become a network, kind of a new constellation of um, institutions and their leaders who really want to be somehow figuring out, on the one hand, just sort of a, pri a learning community together as they're feeling besieged by our polarized age and they're trying to be as original in their sort of Christian coordinates as possible and not be too reactive and they need one another. Um, but they are, we're sort of bound together, I would say, by a, though we each do different things, like publishing, we each have different sort of superpower, and, and this is why I've been thinking about limits too, like how do our limits interact. Um, I think we're all like very respectful of pluralism. That's what kind of binds us, and we're very outward focused, meaning, so we, but we're, we're sober about the risk to like communities of faith. We believe in religious freedom, but there's a sense in which like the church will die if it only cares about itself as like a political tribe. And I do think that what turns like a lot of young people off is like a sense of when you hear about the irrelevance and so on, it's a sense of like, it's unclear what this is for anymore. It's not civically useful particularly. You don't, you know, and some of that is maybe the church's own, like it's not always loud about its um, graceful sort of triumphs, but I, uh, this is a little apocryphal, but years ago we watched a movie that you thought was, it was not great production quality. It was a Christian movie that was, was called um, Paul, the, the Apostle of Christ, I think it was called. And I, what, the acting wasn't great. We left the theater and I had like tears pouring down my face. Um, it was one of those funny moments where I was like, what do you think? And he was like, could have been worse. <laughs> um, uh, and I was like, oh, you should be more sensitive. <laughs> um, but we, uh, there's a scene in it because they're, they're featuring Paul in prison and then Priscilla and, and um, Priscilla and Aquila in the New Testament, and they're having this argument as like all of the early church, all these Christians are being burned at the stake, and they have this little oasis of a community in Rome, and uh, the, their young sons who are like hot-blooded and are like, mom, we need to like get a bunch of guys together, I mean, to overthrow Caesar, and this is all in the movie, but you're, you're recreating, you know, artistic license. And Priscilla says, she's like, I am not going to leave. I'm a Roman. I'm meant to be here. And then she just says, and I've always, in my head, it's like a, it's a Bible verse, even though it's not. But she said something that has stuck with me, which is, um, our Lord did not call us to rule the world, but to care for it. Mm -hmm. And this was before, like, 2,000 years of Christian political thought really got going. Um, so it's a complex statement, and I do believe in the wise use of power. But um, as you so ably demonstrate. But um, I think something about that has been a bit of a lodestar for me as I'm looking for where is the church looking outward? We have this really rich tradition that is ultimately rooted in action, washing feet, dying for others. And when I see that acted out, it's like I run to it and want to frame put a frame around it and share it. And, but there's also like intellectual resources and, it, and I'm sort of just interested, let's just live the real disease, find who else is doing it. And this is, this is for our world. This is not just for us. If I could just two quick <laughs> points of light as George H.W. used to say. Um, I don't know if Mako and Hagen are still here, but the culture care, the founding around beauty, it, that's a, just a beautiful yeah. thing. To, that's like a positive vision. Um, and then the other thing I'd mention is uh, Walter Kim runs the National Association of Evangelicals, a very big tent evangelical group. And you ask, I asked him for that story, what are your two priorities? And he said the first one is racial reconciliation, and the second one is Christian civic education. 
And if he can do that with a big, pretty powerful organization like the NAE, that's a sign of, of hope. Yes. So David, let's talk about your um, adventures in neuroscience because that was <laughs> maybe not what people were expecting to hear, but it was fascinating. And you have certainly talked to a lot of those who are really beginning to understand some of the intricacies of how our brains do what they do. Some of this, I think we've sort of known, but it's getting a whole lot more uh, visibility or awareness now. I mean, wasn't it Pascal who said, the heart has reasons that reason knows nothing of? Same kind of idea. Uh, he says the heart, but you would say the brain. Yeah. Uh, just no, I would say the whole body. <laughs> okay, all right, cover it. Uh, but it, it seems a little unsettling uh, as you go through your now awareness of just how distorted yeah, your own self-hallucinations are, including looking at me right now. Does that throw you, I mean, in terms of your enjoyment of daily life? Does this increase your <laughs> awe? Or does it yeah. make you feel like, oh, I wish I could stop thinking about that? Good question. Yeah. <laughs> I've been wondering this too. <laughs> I, I, I'll, I'm always running into walls just to see if they're there. Like, <laughs> uh, I, I guess it, it one, uh, I, as I tried to say, it makes me more appreciative of human beings. <clears throat> two, uh, the phrase that the scientists use is constructionism, that we construct our reality. Mm -hmm. Another phrase that's important is developmentalism, that we're always in a process and a journey. Another, like, I, it was funny, because I, I, we have talked about this. I did The Social Animal 10 years ago. I talked to people, and now I talk to a lot of the same people. And so, of the things that have changed, much more emphasis on the body. Uh, the distinction between the brain and the body is probably not a sensible distinction. Uh, and, in fact, distinctions are not sensible distinctions. That, in general, a lot of the distinctions we make like about the different regions, there are regional differences in the brain, my understanding is, but we've talked about this. There are vast network effects. Yes. There's just a lot more interconnection. Oh, yes. And we so have so oversimplified the idea that yeah. there's this part and like that part. Fears right? in the amygdala and like all that stuff. Uh, and so the, the field is moving so fast, but that emphasis on the body really centers the emotions because there, there are neurons, there are millions and millions of them and the constant communication between the brain and the body, mm. and what the body is doing is creating body states. And the brain is trying to budget, how much energy do I send here and there? And that conversation is one of the central conversations that produces emotion. And I will say the one thing, the, the scientists I talk to will say, you know, this distinction between reason and emotion is bogus. And then five minutes later, they talk about emotion and they talk about reason. <laughs> and so yes. I think we're at a state where our words are not adequate to our science. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that, that's a potentially revolutionary state. But to me, the, the big thing is that it really undermines the idea that, that it, the Cartesian idea that we're rational or primary rational, utility maximizing, linearly thinking f f creatures. That in the great, neuroscience does not give you new ideas about humanity but it tells you who was right and who was wrong. <laughs> and Descartes was wrong. <laughs> I told them that this morning. I was in <laughs> great dismay, by the way. Yeah. I was not happy about that conclusion. And, and um, <clears throat> David Hume was right. Yeah, I told him that too. But Did I you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm I still glad like you didn't Pascal say the opposite, because then I would have been worried. <laughs> <laughs> I would have been worried. How does this help you, though, with things like beauty or joy or pain um, to have this in new insight into what those experiences involve as far as the complexities of what your whole body is up to when something beautiful happens? Does, do you think about that? Yeah, we should I bring Mako up here for that. I will say one <laughs> quick thing. It's a miracle that we agree, yeah. that we see the same reality when we do. And that's the power of culture. And it's also the power of human beings creating institution after institution, schools, churches, museums, in order to educate our emotions, educate us to see the world in the same way. Uh, and I, I, you know, I, one of the things I love about interviewing cognitive science and neuroscientists, they are not Philistines. They are deeply cultured and deeply artistic people for whom the perceptual powers of the brain are just awesomely subtle. Uh, and the granularity with which some people, that you can train yourself to see, 
I, to get back, keep talking about Mako, but I admire him, so why shouldn't I? <laughs> Mako once, um, we were, were in front of one of his canvases in um, New York, a blue canvas, I can't remember the name of it, but it was a big blue canvas, and Mako said, like, stand here for 15 minutes. I was like, 15 minutes? Yeah. <laughs> but sure enough, you begin to see all these subtle shadings that you had never seen in a 30 second viewing. Mm. And so what you see, I don't know how it's working up here, but it's the, the key, one of the key skills of perception is granularity. And if you can see 800 shades of blue, why would you want one? <sighs> Similarly, and this is a crucial skill for us as humans, is emotional granularity. Some people see good, bad. They, I feel good, I feel bad. But some people can tell the difference between stress, anxiety, uh, frustration, and they have 900 gradations mm -hmm. of that feeling. And you're just living a much richer life if you can identify your emotions more precisely. Yes. So we only have a little bit of time left, and I'm going to try, since this is the last session of an intensely interesting and important two-day gathering of people who care about science and care about faith to ask you to be a little futuristic and if BioLogos uh, were to gather again well we will in two years I trust right Deb but okay let's um, go forward a little further than that in a decade um, where do you think we're going to be it seems like we're in this incredibly stressful situation that is unstable and could go in all kinds of directions, both in terms of what happens with our culture, with our world, with things like climate change, uh, certainly with the church. Um, maybe I'll ask each of you to kind of put your best guess on that, because I think we're all really struggling uh, to try uh, to see much past tomorrow or the next day. Today is hard enough. And maybe I'll, I'll start with you. Do you have do you have a vision here and all of the thinking that you do and talking to lots of people that you publish in Comet Magazine, there's so much deep thought going into our circumstances, but does it translate into some kind of vision? That's the big question. Yeah, I don't, I think some kind of vision may not happen in two years, but I... We'll go to 10. We'll go to, well, I can do, I'll do what I think in two years, and this is a... <laughs> <clears throat> total a little shot in the dark, but it is, it, it's hope and I think it's realistic. Um, David joked that I'm the painter, so I'm going to take that and run with it. Um, uh, the, there's just an image that I, I think it's actually a Monet painting, um, that often comes to mind when I think about hope in our culture, and it's lily pads. And I do think this has been a time where I just hear, because I, in my position, I'm really lucky, I get to sort of hear a eclectic array of pain points from different communities, racially, class, urban, rural, different sectors, different positions. And a lot of that's just journalistic. You know, you're trying to hear and you're trying to find patterns. And it's been such an exhausted time where it feels like we've just been, all of us have been in mud of like what we thought was true about our shared common life, our shared moral narrative, it doesn't seem like we have that anymore, or shared points of reference. Um, but I am seeing there are like lots of, I, and I think this will crystallize even more, there are lots of green shoots, they're not really connected with each other, mm -hmm. of, and they tend to be proximate, they tend to be locally bounded, they're not, I don't have tons of hope right now at some big national scale. Um, but people who see a problem are responding to a need, and I think part of why, I'm, I'm a little self-conscious of talking so much about limits, and I am thinking of Mako, who's introduced, you know, uh, who has taught me so much about abundance. And, and I think there's a relationship actually between limits and abundance. But I think people, as we are realizing what we can do in our small ways, there, whether it's neighborhoods that, that come alive and people who are living into that reality of our interdependence or artistic, there's, I think there's a lot of, including in the church, I'm seeing a lot of reinventing of, of just church as almost like early church gathering, gathering small and like l lots of little points of light. And maybe that's always been true, but I feel like it's been muted over the last number of years as like the large, more abstract warfare of our moment has crowded into our intimate relationships. Um, and I'm seeing people find ways for small projects collaboratively. And then the, the question is, what do you make of all of them together? What do the thousand points of light yield? But I do think in two years that's going to be a lot stronger, a lot more like many communities of care and communities of character um, that are kind of candles amidst an ongoing 
kind of dark, harsh time. Yeah, maybe but, light. But not necessarily that. coherent in two years, maybe yeah. coherent in 10. <laughs> I like the light driving out the darkness because that's what we need. David. I've, I've become um, cheered over this last couple of years or. Gosh, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> By alcohol. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> now, uh, I, I read a book that was written in 1981 by Samuel Hunting, the Harvard, Harvard political scientist. And it's called The Politics of Disharmony. And he says, you know, every six years or so, America seems to go through a moral convulsion. People are disgusted with established power. Outsider groups want to come inside. Uh, new communication comes up, technology comes on the scene. A new moralistic generation arises. There's just a lot of anger and tumult. And it happened in the 1770s. It happened with populism in the 1830s. It happened in the 1890s. It happened in the 1960s. And so writing about 1981, he says, you know, I don't believe in 60-year cycles, but if this pattern holds true, somewhere around 2020, we'll have another moral convulsion. Well, here we are. So I thought, well, that's pretty good. <laughs> uh, and, but the good news is we come out of them. But we come out of them different. So the year, high school yearbook in 1965, all the guys have crew cuts. In 68, half have crew cuts, half have long hair. By 75, they all have long hair. <laughs> And you get a vast change between 65 and 75 in civil rights and feminism and all sorts of things. And so there are periods of tumult and change and culture shift. But that doesn't mean cultural destruction. It just feels like that at each moment. And so when I look at uh, the moment we're in right now, why is there so much authoritarianism around? Because when you give people freedom and it feels like chaos, they will escape from freedom. And they did in the 30s, and I covered Russia in the 90s, they did it in Russia in the 90s, and we got Putin. And there are a lot of people all around the world who want to escape freedom into order. Why are our institutions so bitterly divided? Because people are moral creatures. And if you give them no moral system in which sin runs down the heart of every person, they're going to adopt a very easy moral system where sin runs between groups, between us and them. And the problem with that is if you're asking politics to deliver salvation for you, you're asking more of politics than it can bear. And it's ultimately self-defeating. And you end up not with moral chaos, but with just moral war. And so it's a bad solution. And so where might a better solution be? Well, it might lie with a group of beliefs that believes that sin and salvation are, with, are within us and toward a greater being. And that we're deeply broken and gloriously made, which is actually true. And to me, some sort of um, confident projection of a superior human anthropology and a superior set of how do you be a moral person is... Um, within the Christian world, and I speak autobiographically here. I spent many years touring and speaking to Christian colleges and Christian organizations and going to Christian conferences when I was a complete atheist. But uh, I found it so deep and beautiful. <laughs> mm. And I would read Reinhold Niebuhr and Keller, and all these people, and I just found it convincing and beautiful and then gradually, it seemed true. And I didn't have a moment where Jesus walked through the wall and said, well, and said, come follow me. It was, it was gradual. And I really think it was in part by spending so much time on Christian college campuses mm. and with our friend, old friend Michael Cromer, he used to have a thing called the Faith Angle Forum, just meeting and imbibing the ideas. And they went from beautiful to true. Mm. And I became a Christian around 2013, 2014, a transition I like into investing in the stock market in 1929. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but uh, so my message for all Christian organizations, but especially a unique Christian organization that has a scientific literacy, is always be not afraid. You have what the world is hungering for which is a, a spiritual vocabulary, a spiritual focus, uh, an actual way to orient your life to a higher good. And believe me, I, I teach at Yale, a secular school. My students are hungering for that. Mm -hmm. And if fed it in the right way, they would be delighted <laughs> to learn. So there's just such power, um, sort of moral power in, in the 2000 year tradition. 
uh, and in the demonstration of, of sincere and beautiful faith. <laughs> and so th those are resources. And that is an encouragement and also a reminder that we are not passive in this challenge of what comes in the next 10 years. Uh, we are God's children. Yes, uh, we are weak, but he is strong. His grace is sufficient despite uh, the fact that um, we are weak. In fact, his strength is made perfect in our weakness. And that seemed so upside down to me when I first became a Christian, and now it makes the most perfect sense. All of us here in this room have gathered for these two days, I think, to reflect on the place we are, to deepen our own understanding of what God is calling us to, to marvel at the awe of what we've been given in terms of gifts of nature and God's Word and the way that we can interpret it. We've w worried about whether we're doing the right things in terms of bringing those spiritual worldview and scientific worldviews together. Uh, we've debated about what more we might be doing as a biologos community about climate change and I think very much embrace this is something we must take with great seriousness. And so I wanted to ask that sort of last question about the next 10 years because I think this is going to be a critical time, uh, not just for this small foundation, but really uh, for our whole community and for our whole planet. And to the extent that we go away from this after some worship, which I'm really looking forward to, inspired, energized, not to feel like passive victims, because sometimes it feels that way, but to feel like uh, we are, in fact, uh, the, the army that God is going to use. I don't like the military verse uh, 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 analogy there. We are the people that, that God is going to use uh, to try to find the way forward so that maybe this 60-year cycle doesn't have to have a long dwell time <laughs> and we can in fact see ourselves into a new and different kind of religious and scientific and personal experience. Maybe even, David, we'll figure out new ways to behold each other. Thank you all so much. This is, thank you. <laughs> David and Ann, you're awesome. Thank you. Thank you.